Coming to you from Byron, Mississippi, it's Lakeshore Church. And now we join Pastor Jay Frazier for today's message. If you have a copy of God's Word, we invite you to Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. And all these years and decades of preaching, I probably have used this text as much as any. Very familiar portion I've been just, uh, I love for many, many years, I love the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gave us a lot to live by. Uh, and right in the middle of his sermon, uh, there in chapter 6, we find some words that remind us uh, really where we're going today to take charge of the change that we have in our life. Verse number 31 through 33 of Matthew 6. So don't worry. <laughs> saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. I remember a long time ago that we learned that predominantly when the word Gentile is used in the, in the New Testament, it's referring to worldly people. It, it's, it's, it's referring to people around us, and we would even say that don't know Christ, that are acting very worldly. And so it's saying we can get caught up in acting worldly. You with me? We can be fretting. We're worried. We're, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? And all the cares of today. Don't do that like the Gentiles. We're different. But here's the command. But seek ye first <laughs> the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. We, we seek the kingdom first. We seek that relationship with him and what we're supposed to be, but also something else that's really for today, and his righteousness. Today, I think that, that we've been, and it's, it's my fault. You know, I think of it, it's the, it's, the, it's the cloth's fault, it's the pastor's fault, it's the preacher, it's the leader's fault in the church that we've spent so much time making sure people are changed. Remember this, there's also a life after the change. We call that the righteousness of God. So we have... The kingdom, we're part of the kingdom, the change, but then we have a life that goes with that. Righteous living, if you will. So, right living. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord. Simply, I'll ask for my words to be yours and my thoughts to be yours. This so resonates with me. I, I know it resonates with us. God, that you've called us, yes, to be changed, to be born again, but you've also called us, Lord, to take charge of that change after salvation. Truly, God, you'll use us today and We'll be careful to walk in obedience to what we hear, not only myself, but all of us. And God, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory for what you do, for we ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So far in this 2021 and the 21 ways, again, we'd encourage if you don't have that at your fingertips yet, we have them at the Information Center. We have the bookmarks, and you can see how that goes. But you can also um, go to lakeshorecmc.org, our website. And click on that banner, and then it'll, it'll take you to a, a, a link that will show it to you. And then you can screenshot it, and you can have it. I, you should have it. You know, we have everything else on our phone. We should have that. And uh, we're going to be commenting on several of those in just a, just a few minutes. But so far, we've introduced the 21 ways. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the possibilities of one, one year. What could happen in, a, in our life, and predominantly spiritually thinking, what could actually happen? What could I do, and God do with me and through me in one year? And then last week, we, we talked about the dynamics of in and out, being in the family of God, in the ark of safety. We also talked about being reminded that there are yet people who are outside, and, we're, and the dynamics that we're supposed to affect those people. They're supposed to see Christ in our life. But for today, it's not only the change, not only talking about that being in, the change that God makes in our life, but taking charge of that and, and seeing the responsibility of living it out. I do think, and for, for maybe there's a better way to say it, but I do think we've dumbed it down. We've spent so much time. I've had people before say, preacher, don't worry about me. I'm right. <laughs> I've been saved. Don't worry about me. And we have a lot of theology and doctrine and conversation about whether somebody's been changed or not. And it doesn't seem like we have much conversation about the charge or the responsibility I have to live it afterwards. And that's really where we're going today. So take charge of that. Leo Tolstoy, I'm not a, a, a fan <laughs> I could not have to read long to find out things that we disagreed on. That, uh, he, he studied Christianity. He was a famed Russian writer, did a lot of great writing that, that people appreciate. 
But he himself, in his spiritual world, he studied Christianity, also studied Buddhism and Hinduism and other religions. And, and out, of that, out of that, in his forward thinking, he thought, he just became a person that, that, that basically gave up everything and deprived himself of any things. And he was a very affluent man. But yet, he said this, and it's a great saying that applies for today. And uh, everyone wants to change, wants, thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. And so today, and I, I am the best at talking about all the issues we have in our world and the things that need to change, maybe for the next few minutes we would key in on, God, show me how to change me. Show me how to take charge of the change in my life. And that's what the 21 ways does. It's really good. There's 21 things there that I'm not talking about what you need to do. I'm dealing with what I need to do, and therefore I know I'll affect others if I'm doing those things. You know, it's unique in God's creation. God has always had somebody in charge. Our lives are no different. God expects us to take charge of the change that has occurred. Have you ever stopped and thought why we're going to give an account to the Lord? Why is there going to be a judgment day account? Why is there going to be those types of things? We're going to give an account for this life that God gave us after salvation, what we did with it. Listen to this. A horse has reins. <laughs> a vehicle has a steering wheel. A boat has a rudder. And one more, a bicycle has handlebars. I believe the reason I saved the bicycle to last is I believe it should be a hands-on relationship that we have with God. God's hands are on us, but he also gives us responsibility. You're not doing too well on a bicycle if your hands are not on the handlebars. And yet I want to tell you today that there are many people, what's going on in their life, think about this now, one of the saddest things you'll ever hear me say is I've dealt with suicide, I've dealt with people who have attempted suicide, and many times when you hear the story, basically what they're saying Maybe in different ways, what they're saying is, I could not, listen to this, handle it anymore. I don't think that's just a play on words. I, I really believe there's something to this handle business. And I'm not going to use this on anybody today. But whatever tool goes on the end of the handle, listen to me very carefully. It, the, what's on the end, whether it's an axe or a Kaiser blade or whatever it is, whatever goes on the end of the handle is no good without the handle listen to me very ch carefully child of God for us to think we're doing okay because we've been changed if we're not handling it if we're not in charge of this change that God's had in our life if we're not working toward being more what God wants us to be then what good is the change the best you can hope for is fire insurance that you're going to heaven but God's called us to more than that before we get there and today I want you to handle it it's amazing when you start thinking about these words and these phrases that are used in our, in our society, in our culture. It's amazing how many of them come to mind. When I think along those lines, again, the tool is not much good without the handle. So today, what does God's Word say about this charge after the change? Listen to this. In Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, it says, Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to the things of old. Look, I am about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Sounds like the day and age we're living in. Joshua 1, 9, haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Romans 12, verse 2 says, don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can discern what is the good and pleasing and perfect will of God. Psalm 51, 10 says, God created a clean, God created a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Could hang out there just for a minute and tell you God expects us to grow up. Amen? There's a lot of times we need to understand that that applies spiritually as well. Paul did some great writing along those lines as well in other places. Not just there. And then the last one in John chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus said to the man, get up. Jesus told him, pick up your mat and walk. The reason this stuck out to me is we want to be reminded that God met his need. God, he, Jesus healed him, but Jesus didn't leave him where he is. If we sell a bill of goods to people that God will not change you after you've been changed and God will not charge you and give you responsibility to clean up and be what God wants you to be after salvation, then it'd be just like Jesus telling him, just stay where you are. There was no need for the man to stay where he used to be because Jesus had changed him. 
But there was a charge to him to get up and be different. Don't live in the same place. The prodigal son, I know it's a parable, but he didn't, when he came to himself, he didn't stay in the same place. God changes us. He not only wants to be our Savior and take us to heaven, but he wants to be our Lord before we get there. Listen, taking charge. We'll give you some thoughts along these lines. Some of it will sound redundant. If you take notes, you'll say, we said that last week. There's some of it that goes together. But today it's about taking the responsibility after the change. There's some people that would look at those 21 ways and say, well, that sounds good, but do I really have to? No, you don't have to. But you're living beneath your privileges. And then when it comes down to somebody beside us or kin to us or works beside us or lives near us that needs to see Christ in our life, they might not see him in the capacity they need to because we've not taken charge of this change that has happened in our life. So taking charge, number one, it's a mindset. I believe there's a necessity to identify the change. I believe there can be major things in your life, but I think there are also minor things. I think as a person grows in the Lord, the little things become magnified in our life. And we realize that we're living, we're not where we need to be. The Song of Solomon takes us up in, in Song of Solomon 2 verse 15. It, Solomon said this, it's the little foxes. It was talking about relationships, but it fits for all departments of our life. It's the little foxes that spoil the vineyard. What was he talking about? I think there's a lot of times in our spiritual life, it's easy to take, give the big things. But I really believe the enemy hangs out in the little things. It's those little things maybe nobody knows about. Maybe it's a, for me, maybe it's a harbored attitude, attitude, terrible attitude. Maybe it's something nobody knows about, but the Lord knows about it. And he hangs out there in my life because he knows I can't be everything that I need to be for him if I've not committed everything to him. The little foxes, it's a mindset. We play the game that, that we make it big. If Lord, when I get a five-gallon bucket full of sin or issue in my life, I'll bring it all to you. But I'll tell you how you know and think this is a great thing to remember. If God deals with you, it must be pretty big. Think about it. If the God of the universe that made everything that we know from nothing, if today in this service or by Facebook all of a sudden you sense the Spirit of God began to convict you and reveal himself to you about something in your life, it must be big, pretty big. Amen? And see, just think a lot. That, that, that helped me years ago. Maybe even before I was in the ministry, I realized, wait a second. If God deals with me about something, it must be pretty big. Maybe the way I said something, maybe the way I treated somebody, maybe it was an attitude, maybe nobody knew about it. If God reveals himself to me, it must be pretty big. So it's a mindset. Secondly, it involves motivation. Once again, we've said it every sermon since 2021 has started, but it's got to be intentional. You know, it drives me crazy today of how much our society, this will be a little soapbox stuff here for the next minute. It's amazing how much uh, brilliant minds have told us to, to believe in chance. They, believe, they tell us to believe in accidents. And I'm telling you, people today, they, they, they throw away the thought of, uh, of the theology that there's a God and there's a creator that created everything and want us to believe in evolution, want us to believe in the Big Bang that just accidentally and randomly all this came to be out of some random, random order that occurred. I want to tell you, it takes more faith to believe that than to believe that there's a God that created it all and we're going to give an account to him. See, think along these lines. It involves motivation. We must see the need. We must have a moment with God, something that unsettles us, whatever that looks like, that we have a moment that all of a sudden something happens and shakes us to the core and it motivates us to take charge of this change in our life. Surely, I think today, if there's ever been something that should shake us, it should be the world situation. Um, I don't know I ever felt, I, I've never felt the way I feel today. I believe with everything about me in my lifetime that uh, I could be challenged legally for standing on this platform, for standing on the Word. Hmm. Think about it. To, to be what God says for us to be and to say, this is what the Word says. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. And it says this in the Word that that could come. We live in a day and age. I said, if there's, a, if there's a new saying that should be in America for Jay, for me today, it's I never thought. I never thought the stuff that's paraded around as being okay and we're supposed to accept it and, and all the things today. And if we don't, we're the ones that are regressive. We're the ones that are old school and we need to wake up and realize it's a brand new day and everything's okay and everything's right. I've only got one problem with that and the Word of God doesn't endorse it. It involves motivation. I never thought. But I believe God wants us to be motivated to stick out. I've said that every sermon as well. Not only there, but another one, we've got to make adjustments. I think we've got to deal with the sane insanity that's out there. <laughs> 
The reason I said that today, it's whatever it seems to be. I remember, I don't know how that saying came. I don't know if it was a movie. I don't know if it was just in high school. But I can remember like it was yesterday when Zane Frazier started saying whatever when I talked to him. And I would have feelings come over me that weren't spiritual. I mean, it was almost like subscribing to, I brought you in this world. I'll take you out and make another one just like you. You know, that kind of feeling. I said, it wouldn't hurt too bad me just do away with him. But I mean, it's one of those deals, whatever. I'd say something to him, whatever. But he always said it at a distance where I couldn't get a hold of him. Whatever. But you know what I think today? There's a lot of people that are living their Christian life. Listen to me. Just whatever. Like we're randomly going through this thing. I'm telling you, I think it's time for us to get very pointed with the target and say, God, if you'll help me, I want to take charge of this change that you made in me. I'm tired of being in and out and cold and hot and up and down and all over the place. I want to get intentional the way I live and not this accidental hope I get there stuff. I believe we can help you. I believe God will honor it. But we got to make adjustments in our life if we realize we're not where we need to be. You know the modern definition of insanity, don't you? I'm going to give it to you in about 30 seconds. Let me give you the old definition. The old definition of, is summed up this way. When somebody loses their mental faculties, that's what insanity means. All of a sudden, they can't get it together. All of a sudden, they've just checked out for whatever reason. Some type of trauma, whatever. All of a sudden, it doesn't, you know, they just lose it. They just shut down. Here's the modern term for, tech, for insanity. It's doing the same thing over and over and expect different results. I want to be a prayer warrior, but I'm not changing my behavior so that I can become a prayer warrior. I'd like to be able to know what the Word of God says, but I don't change my behaviors to get in the Word. I'd like to be used of God, but I'm not changing anything that takes me there. On and on we could go with examples. So many people want it, but it's the very modern day definition of insanity is we want something, but yet we're doing the same old thing wanting a different result. We got to make adjustments if we realize that's not there. Now, one more. I think along these lines, it's following the master. Taking charge is following the master. It starts in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. We shared that last week. The old has passed away and behold, all have become new. That's where it starts. But then it keeps on. That, and we need to understand this. We open the door of our heart and Jesus resides in us. Don't you believe today that if he's inside of us, it will affect our life? How is it that we've gotten so good that he can be inside of us, but our external life, the way we live, does not reflect him being on the inside? I think that's one of the most dangerous things to me theology-wise. Listen to me very carefully. The Scripture says you know that you pass from death unto life because you love the brethren. And what that means to me is when Christ comes on the inside, he makes a monumental difference in our life. I don't believe it's just something you do in some, some abstract deal. I believe it's a concrete relationship with Almighty God. And if he comes inside the house, I believe he's going to affect the house. I like this verse, but, but look at this. John 15, 14 says this, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Isn't that good stuff? Hey, that's great, isn't it? You know, I, I think about, there, there's Glenn over there. Uh, our care pastor, Glenn, I just want you to know this is what our friendship is based on. You need to do everything I tell you to do. Huh? Isn't that a great friendship? Oh, I love it. I, I, really, I really do. Hey, hey, Al. Good, but we're friends. But our friendship is predicated on every time I tell you to do something, you do it. That doesn't sound like friendship, does it? That doesn't sound like friendship at all. Sounds like a dictatorship. That's not a friendship. But let me tell you why it's a friendship. You ready? Because Jesus knows what you need. See, he knows. <laughs> he knows tomorrow. Mm. He knows what's coming. The friendship part is the reason he, he says, you're going to be my friend. If you want to have this great relationship with me, you want to be close to me, then do what I tell you to do because I know what you need. That's the great news. Al, I'm going to let you down, buddy. Probably already have. Glenn knows that. I'm going to let you down, Glenn, because we're just finite. But bless God to have a friendship with somebody who's infinite. And because of him knowing that's where the friendship is, is when you obey him, holiness the lordship of christ when you obey, obey him he will always take you where you need to go isn't that good stuff the problem comes in our friendship when we think we know as much as jesus knows mighty quiet in here isn't it i hope it's not that quiet on facebook when i think about it we need to understand hmm, it's following the master you know what <laughs> we need to hear this according to this verse it's not a democracy it's not even a republic it is a dictatorship because he loves us and he knows the direction we need to go with our life. He knows. Let me close this way. 
when I think along those lines. Where, do, where does 21 ways fit here? I want to unpackage some of these today. I take too much time, but I got really carried away at 830. There were some rough folks that needed all of this. But anyway, maybe won't stay there as long for you guys. But here, here's the thought. Where, where, does 20, where does 21 ways fit? 1.4, I call it, is fasting. Fasting is simply summed up as something in your life that's worth sacrificing for. Predominantly, fasting is seen in the Word of God by doing without food so that God sees that you're serious and that you're travailing over something so He'll make it the difference. Listen, God's people were preserved because Esther called for a fast. It's a great study. Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. You know why he did? He did that for the Ten Commandments. How about that? Before he wrote the Ten Commandments on the tablets, he spent 40 days and 40 nights preparing himself to hear from God. And I believe there was a perspective involved in that. What's the big deal about honoring your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth? What's the big deal of bearing false witness? (laughs) Prepared. On and on we go. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights before he was tempted in the wilderness. What in the world? He's the son of God. Why did he have to fast? Well, I want to remind you, he was not only 100% God, but he was also 100% man. He was tempering that physical part, that fleshly part of him to be able to be victorious. The Pharisees accused (laughs) Jesus' disciples of not fasting. Listen to this now. And you know what Jesus replied to them? "Why Why don't your disciples fast like we do? Why do they not have to fast? And he said this great deal. He said, why does the bride have to fast for a groom when they already have the groom? (laughs) Listen, this is good stuff. If you're in a dry spot, if if you wonder, does God have more for me? Try fasting. See, he was saying there will come a time when I will no longer be with them and then they'll fast. Great thought. They were fasting for God's presence, his being in their life. Then we think of another one that comes to mind today. 1.5 is about forgiveness. Forgiveness is basically not allowing a situation to own you. Hmm. There's a need for us to cut things loose in actuality. When unforgiveness exists, that thing we're worshiping more than we're even worshiping Christ. I'll tell you this, it's not a a good thing to say, but I've actually lost people out of churches because I preach on forgiveness. It's the only thing that God highlighted. We think God understands. We think God understands that harbored feeling over somebody that did something to us. Hello? Listen, all I can tell you is over three decades of church work, people have done a lot. It hurts when people run their mouth. It hurts when people say things. It hurts when people do things. And we need to understand that you can harbor that and have issue, or you can give it to the Lord, and God will (laughs) help you with it. I often often say, how do you know that you have unforgiveness in your heart? Well, is there a name I mentioned, and your blood pressure would go up, and you get short of breath, and you'd start grinding your molars together? Years ago, I do have a sick and demented side. I'm now, more of me is more mature than I used to be. But I had a guy in my previous community where I lived. He had problems with people. He had two or three men he couldn't stand. I'm talking about operating in unforgiveness. They'd done this against him and that against him. I used to like go by his place of business and somewhere in the conversation, I'd just mention one of them's name. And I'd like to see him get all torted up and that man contorted and he'd start just chewing on his tongue, saying all kind of things. But the point I want to remind you of is this. Why in the world would I allow something to be between my Savior and me? Mm, there's not a single amen in the house. I appreciate that. You know what? I'll tell you this, and I'll move on. We think God understands. Let me tell you something what God understands. God understands the same blood that came out of his body for the remission of my sins came out of his body for their sins. And so the moment that I think God understands might be the tightest place I'll ever be in with God as far as being confused about something. A couple more. 1.6 is about vices. It says the first 21 days of each quarter. Now we're coming up, we just finished one, and and, uh, you get a break. If you haven't done it, it's good to start today. But 21 days that you'll commit to to relinquishing a vice to the Lord. This is how I define a vice. It's something we know causes us to live short of God's path for our life. Doesn't necessarily mean it's right or wrong or you've been convicted of it, but you know it doesn't bring glory and honor to the Lord. Give you a couple of examples in my life that, you know, biblically, people say, well, it's not biblical, so I don't have to do it. I think God deals in different ways. One of the things I used to do years ago, and I'm not proud of it. Some people say, I can't believe you did that. But I used to read the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. When I lived in Georgia, it came to our town about an hour and a half below, and they they delivered it every morning, and and I would get the Atlanta paper. I love the sports section and all that, still do it on the Internet. But when I would get through with the Atlanta paper, (laughs) 
riding down the road, I would roll down my window and I would throw the whole paper out the window. It looked like a parachute at the drag strip. You know what I'm talking about? When it went to, when I'm going down the road. And one day God convicted me. And it wasn't a preacher preaching. It wasn't a devotional. It was just a thought came over my mind that this is God's creation. And that's not right. Oh, it's all them guys that are in prison. They need to be picking up stuff. They need to be doing something instead of just sitting around. We justify our behaviors anytime we want to. But God convicted me. Hey, listen, I cringe when I'm riding with one of you and you roll down the window and throw out a candy wrapper now. But the point is, is that's something God dealt with me about. That was a vice in my life. It was something that didn't bring glory unto the Lord. Unto the Lord. Another one, speech. I grew up in a family where if you cut me, I cut you deeper with my tongue. Well, I found out in adult life that's not too good. To pick on people and cut people down from the pulpit is not really a good behavior. There's another thing about by words. I know there's a lot of things I could probably say. There's things with crazy stuff that we say. But a long time ago, God dealt with me about the things that you say. By words, curse words, whatever you want to say. Cuss words for the South. But this is the thing about it. People look at it and go, well, it's no big deal, preacher. It's not. See, what happens is are we bringing glory and honor to the Lord? It might not be something God's convicted you of, but I want to ask you, does it bring glory and honor to the Lord? What comes out of our, out of our mouth? And a long time, I decided, a long time ago, I decided not to do it. I don't have many things to, to glory in because I failed miserably. But you know this is amazing. Suzanne's never heard me curse. And I used to have a, a, a filthy mouth when I was a teenager. Filthy. Not as bad as some of you, but it was filthy. Just wonder if you're still there. Here's what I want you to know. My kids have never heard me curse. I wanted to a few times, but I didn't. God won. The seriousness of what I'm saying is this. Why wouldn't we? Why do we spend all our time justifying stuff that we, if we just got along with God, we know there are behaviors and things in our life that don't bring glory and honor to the Lord, that are not taking us the right direction, regardless of grace, regardless of mercy and all those things. Why is it that we just don't say, wait a second? Hmm? And that's what I want you to think about. If I'm going to be what God wants me to be, if you're going to be what God wants us to be, wants you to be, you got to take charge of the change that God started in your life. Good stuff. The last one is very convicting to me is this. It's the body. There's a lot in there. 3.2 talks about exercise. 3.5 talks about food intake. Intake amount. And 3.6 talks about what I eat. Great conviction. I share these things with you to tell you. God expects you and me to take charge of the change in our life and you know what and I'll end here the tool of your life everything that God does for you in your life is not much good if you're not handling it thank you for listening to this broadcast from Lakeshore Church in Byram Mississippi with Pastor Jay Frazier We invite you to visit lakeshorecmc.org to find out more online. That's lakeshorecmc.org. Thank you for joining us.